the, the question is, what if, uh, what if Russia decided to invade uh, the Baltic states, for example, or what if they decided to invade Poland? Uh, well, now we're talking about uh, Russia invading NATO. And then when, when Russia uh, uh, crosses the line into a, a NATO country, uh, then uh, the NATO will respond with o overwhelming force. There's, there's no question about that. And I, if it happens during the Biden administration, I am certain that that will be uh, the response of the Biden administration. If it happened uh, during the Quigley administration, I can guarantee that that would be the response of the Quigley administration. I mean, just on a technical level, uh, uh, Biden has uh, positioned 300,000 uh, additional troops uh, in Poland uh, to prevent that eventuality. Uh, on the uh, South Korean side, which as everyone knows, South Korea is our, our steadfast ally, uh, we, we've stationed just under 500 F-35s uh, in South Korea. Uh, so, so we have massive uh, firepower on both sides of Russia uh, waiting for that eventuality to happen. Uh, because if Russia were to invade a NATO country, uh, it doesn't mean they only get bombarded from, uh, from the western side of Russia. Uh, Russia will take the full brunt of, of the uh, allied forces from, from both directions, from the top as well. So, so, so the response would be robust and it would be, it would be very harsh for the, for the Russian people. Um, I think, you know, an, an interesting way to go with this is to understand that we've also put huge economic sanctions on Russia. We, are, we have marginalized Russia in the international institutions. And there are pundits out here in the community that are saying, well, well the economic sanctions aren't, aren't having an effect. Uh, that's not true. The, the economic sanctions are causing huge problems for the Russians. And uh, it, it's, it's uh, hurting them in the way one would expect economic sanctions to hurt. And that is in the daily lives of the Russians themselves. Um, so Western companies have pulled out, Western investment has, have, has pulled out, and this process continues. So McDonald's isn't McDonald's anymore in Russia. You know, they, they closed every one of their stores, for example. Uh, expert, Western expertise has come out of Russia. Uh, in, the, in the case of the Quigley administration, we would take that one step further. Uh, <clears throat> we firmly believe that uh, institutions like the United Nations uh, should not be available to, uh, to countries like Russia. I mean, uh, Russia holds a Security Council seat, which gives them a permanent veto uh, over anything the UN does. And we have seen time and time again, since the UN was formed, that the, that the, that the overall UN system is not effective. It just doesn't work anymore for keeping global peace and for reining in uh, dictatorship types of actions or aggressive military types of actions like we're seeing with Russia. So the Quigley administration, uh, we will do everything we can to, uh, to first kick Russia out. And, and what I mean by that is I, I, would have the, uh, I would have the FBI, for example, and you know, we would tell the New York City police, hey, we need some help. If necessary, we would send the army. We would physically go in and grab every member of the Russian delegation and we would put them on the, the next airplane out and we would send them out of America. And we, we would do that with every institution, whether we're talking about the World Bank, the IMF, uh, just the list goes on, uh, the WTO and all the rest of it. And at this point in time in 2022, there is no reason to, to, uh, to welcome uh, uh, the, the government of Russia into uh, the, uh, the global arms of peaceful nations. Uh, which is essentially what the United Nations and the other bodies are about. You know, Russia was the aggressor. There was absolutely no reason to, uh, to attack the Ukraine. Any strategic objective could have been solved, uh, like we mentioned a minute ago, with simple capitalistic negotiation. So we really, we, the Quigley administration will, will turn the page on, uh, on how these international institutions operate. And, and this, is, this is one other piece of the oil price problem. We have a 500-year supply of oil. We know where this oil is located. 
the, the December of 2019, uh, essentially weeks before the coronavirus started, America had almost 1,700 oil wells uh, in operation. And uh, almost all of those oil wells were closed down when, every, when the whole country was on lockdown and there wasn't a need for that much oil. Now the oil industry to this very day, and we are in August of uh, 2022 at this filming, uh, they still have not turned back on uh, uh, those uh, oil, well, uh, oil wells and those oil rigs. Uh, at the moment, we are using, uh, as a society, there are about 600 or so operating. So that means uh, about 1,100 of those oil rigs and oil wells are idle. And the reason why the oil companies are doing that is because they are gouging not only America, but the world. Uh, everyone invested in the oil industry is getting super rich. I mean, we're talking about millionaires are being made every day uh, through this behavior. The Biden administration, uh, for all kinds of crazy reasons, which every one of them uh, shows us that, that Biden and the Democrats are not versed in, in domestic economics and in, in national economics, uh, they're, they're not using the Defense Depression Act. You know, they could make every one of those oil wells come back online if uh, Biden would use the Defense Production Act and we'd bring our oil output back up to pre-pandemic levels. Prices would immediately fall, but Biden has no idea what he's doing on this front. His team has no idea what they're doing on this front. On top of that, if you look around the entire country, we have about 120,000 uh, unused oil wells in the country. Now, <clears throat> the uh, sort of folks who don't really know the details might rebut that statement and say, yeah, but those 120,000 oil wells are dry, so of course they're just capped, they're not being used. Well, that's false. Uh, those, every one of those oil wells have some amount of oil in them. So let's just talk about sort of percentages. Some of those oil wells will have 5% of the oil remaining. Some will have 10%, 15%, 20%, 25% of the oil remaining. The key economic issue is some oil is very easy to get out of the ground. And, and, and most of that around the globe has been obtained already. So the, the, the age of cheap oil extraction is over. But that doesn't mean there's not oil there. It means that it costs more to get the remaining oil in those 120,000 oil wells that are on American territory to get that out of the ground. But at current prices, it would still be economical to get that, the rest of that oil out of the ground. Not to mention new, uh, new fields that haven't even been tapped yet. So, for, for the oil production and economic effects, Russia's only impact uh, for Americans is oil uh, and their behavior toward oil. Yeah, Russia is a big producer of natural resources and they grow a lot of wheat and uh, they produce farm products. So the rest of the world, especially the, the poor part of the world, uh, relies upon the Ukrainian wheat and the, and the Russian uh, wheat and foodstuffs and raw materials. China relies on those raw materials. America relies to a, to a little, it's a little bit, but it's not significant. It, it's, it's all replaceable from the American point of view. So Russia's economic impacts are mostly on the rest of the world in areas outside of oil. So as an American, uh, we would, those types of thoughts would not come into our calculation. What is more important is behaving in a way that encourages Russia to, to join the world of civilized nations and to be, behave in a civil way. And, and the, the previous point really that I was making was institutions like the UN and the World Bank and the IMF and the WTO and a bunch of other post-World War II institutions, they have served their purpose. And uh, it's time to move on. You know, we need to move on to something bigger and better. Um, and one of the things the Quigley administration will do is we will, we will form an overarching global organization which specifically deals with the food poverty, you know, the, the fresh water uh, issues around the world. 
You know, I think we talked before about the Amish community's way of living, which is a very sustainable, productive way to live. I'm not sure if many Amish people want to be ambassadors for America, but it's a very easy concept. You know, it's very easy to, uh, to, to teach others about the Amish community and let others emulate what the Amish do. Uh, so, so, and then in terms of the military, we do need a better international military police force. Because, it, 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 in, for example, if the UN actually had a robust military police force, then Putin and his cronies in Moscow, they would have thought two, three, four times about, about invading uh, the Ukraine. Because then they would see that there would be a response and it would be quick and it would be very harsh.